Yeah. All right. Okay, one second. I'll share my screen um, real quick. One second. It's this one. Uh, can you see? Ah, oh, I'm sorry. That's the wrong screen. It's this one. Can you see the slideshow right now? I do. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. Awesome. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our 15th community call. It's the first one that we have in uh, 2024, and hopefully 15 more are coming this year, and we'll see how that goes. But today, uh, we are happy to have our community members on this call, and we'll be talking about AI textbooks. So um, please bear in mind that this call will be recorded. So uh, if you don't want us to um, mess around with editing, uh, please don't say something that you would not like to have on video. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is our small agenda for today. It's a uh, five minutes intro that I'm doing right now, the small uh, demo presentation and the discussion. Uh, so meet our today's guests, uh, Matthias and John. Uh, both of them are entrepreneurs and software developers, and uh, both of them are members of our community. So we are exceptionally happy to see you here. So uh, yeah, it, it's cool to see that people inside of our community are developing cool stuff. So we are actually I, like personal. I can't wait to see what you are doing, guys. So uh, yeah, let's check out AI textbooks and I'm giving the stage to you. Yeah, yes. that's that's it. Awesome, yeah. Thank you so much, Max. Um, yes, so thank you for the introduction. Let me just share with you my slides. Sorry for not having a full... Um, oh, no, wait a second. Sorry, I will just do something better then. Um, one second, please. From having too many uh, windows at once, right? <laughs> Classic. Yes. Um, so, yes, I just want to... <laughs> there we go. Um, uh, yes, I'll just stop this. Let's show. There we go. And I will find you here. And um, there, yes. Can you see this in my screen? Yes, we can. Awesome. Indeed. So yeah, hi everybody. Thank you so much for actually being here. Um, in all the different time zones we are in, uh, it's really exciting, you know, to talk about this this um this topic with you. Um, so yeah, my name is John. Um, we are gonna be presenting about AI textbooks, which in one sentence would be a collaborative knowledge creation through AI interfaces. Um, but yeah, in few words, um, as as Max was already present us, um, we are John and Matthias. We have been doing some research in algorithmic fairness, in, infor in information theory, communications, AI interactions as well. Five years of experience around in the field and. Uh, doing social entrepreneurship as well. So um, yeah, it's it's definitely been a journey at least for it, for the past few weeks and months actually now to 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 do AI textbooks. Uh, but what is it actually? <clears throat> Everything starts with a big problem that is happening right now. That's actually very abstract, but it's also something that's very exciting because uh, I think we all know that knowledge is a moving target. And um, it just keeps growing. And then uh, if we, for example, analyze academia, uh, there is just so much people, so many people doing research. And I don't know if you feel the same way, but then when I try to be up to date with the latest developments in AI, for example, it's almost impossible because I, I feel like every day and every, every like 10, five hours, there's like a new research that is being published that is doing something new, completely different to what others have done. Um, because then knowledge is inherently exponential. The way how it's built is just grows, keep growing as many people participate in it. Um, but also one of the biggest problems that comes with this is that um, the human ability to comprehend all this knowledge is linear. Uh, we have a limit on the way we can consume all this knowledge. And that becomes like a, a, a huge problem because then what it means for us to to actually consume the key ever growing uh, knowledge base that exists out there in the world, um, and also another problem that adds to the same field is that um, the knowledge systems that exist now have, lack that relevant context. One thing that happens is very common now is to use um, recommendation systems. 
like uh, you know the algorithm that will just tell us what to show that is relevant to us based you know on the recollection of data we have uh, but it's kind of uh, very accidental incidental right like we we cannot really choose what kind of uh, context it's been used and also by uh, you know the way how uh, the attention economy works the more attention they can get from us the better it is for them so then there is like a few control over what we really can consume and what knowledge we have access to so then um, that's from the other side there is a problem with the lack of high quality data because it's estimated that um, the high quality data for AI training will be exhausted by 2027. And that's that is a problem because you know right now there are like a, because of the, again the attention economy, um, there is a lot of people that you know are aiming and uh, to be uh, you know influencers, content creators and so. And then it's kind of a similar knowledge and because how trends work, uh, it's easier to follow a format of knowledge that uh, does not really innovate so much into the way how things can turn out to be. Um, so then these high quality data that can come, for example, from, I mean, of course, research papers, but also community creations, uh, is not really so uh, niche and so specific um, that then when we eventually want to train AI models, it would be a problem. And then uh, as you know, there's like a, a lot of papers that actually Microsoft is uh, pushing for, that is to make the higher quality the data is, the smaller the model can be, and the smaller the data set can get, to get the same performance. Um, so then we really need high quality data to keep this growing. Uh, otherwise the models can become as big as possible, but then that will never make up for the lack of high quality data. We know that you know if, if we insert something that is not as good, then of course the AI will just regurgitate the same thing, right? But as I said, it's also impacting multi multiple fields. So then like in research, it's impossible to stay up to date. So much AI research made all around. Um, there is also duplicate work made. You know, sometimes I'm just writing something and then I find someone else who's doing similar thing. And I didn't realize because there is no way to access that and be constantly up to date with everything. And because of that, it was also hard to push for innovation. Also in startups, you know, some of them are acting on outdated knowledge because they are focusing on a specific problem, but then they might be overlooking another way of doing something different as part of the processes. So then there are resources that get allocated for knowing the market as well, instead of making that automatic. So then this modern problem requires a modern solution that is to allow knowledge workers to use the existing AI interfaces, you know, ChatGPT, Llama, like the Discord bot of um, MidJourney and so, with collaborative databases for um, more contextual interaction with knowledge. This is still very abstract. We will get there more, like more and more uh, lower uh, to, to a more practical approach. But the idea is to provide a contextual um, knowledge retrieval uh, that can be used for learning paths for research. And uh, we produce, we we give like an overview of you know, what the startups can actually do not to work on outdated knowledge. But many of you would think of this already as rack systems, which is actually where we are getting. Um, but the idea for us is to democratize knowledge. In which way? Well, to make it accessible for everybody. Um, so the idea is to focus on disruptive innovation. So then let's say that in any field, for example, climate change or any field that requires like a lot of action immediately, if everyone can contribute to the things that need to be automated and can benefit others, then startups, companies can focus on the things that really make sense and really can make a proper impact in the world. But at the same time, if people can actually get their knowledge valued, um, then they can have, like, we can even get to the concept of universal basic income uh, for people creating knowledge. So the idea would be to shift to a knowledge economy from an attention economy, for example, in the idea that um, the higher the quality of knowledge you are sharing with others, the more Rubini you can get, because it's that's the thing that, is, that gets more value. But at the same time, would be to benefit everybody, um, because then fields in research would collaborate with each other. Um, because they would be able to connect diverse knowledge bases. And uh, the, the diverse data as well is also applicable between the, the different contexts and fields. Um, but not only that, the idea would be that uh, these models or like these, these the knowledge bases are training data for, um, for other machine learning models. Because then if the high quality data is used in a proper way, we can make the models smaller that can be more specific for any other thing. And that can support the same idea of having AI agents, for example, which is something that's getting more popular these days. Um, 
by the same time, uh, um, we can discuss this as the diversity as fairness, right? Because um, I did my master's thesis on algorithmic fairness that uh, was discussing about, you know, what it means to be fair. If from a philosophical standpoint, it's impossible to be fair with everybody um, because everyone will have a different perception of what it means to be equal. Um, so then the idea would be that the more diverse these, these uh, knowledge bases are, the easier it is to create proper representation. For example, uh, the pro one problem that's very common, let's say we ask Midjourney or any AI image generation, generate 10 images of people, of CEOs, and many like in eight people will be men and uh, just two will be women, right? That's a problem that actually exists because there is a lack of representation that in, 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 in AI on in computer science is usually thought as the default and the best way we can, you know, show the world how things are the more accurate it is, and because of that, it's more fair, which, you know, in, in philosophy and so it becomes a much more deeper problem, and instead it's a, a matter of diversity. Um, by the same time, uh, these knowledge bases that we can create, all of us contributing and getting benefit from, they can ask, act as capabilities. So then let's say that uh, a government will give you a knowledge base on how to make uh, your taxes, Right. So then the AI models can actually help you to do all of that. So then it's like what capabilities humans can do thanks to AI to to interact within each other. But still, I know this sounds like very uh, abstract. And so so then in practice, uh, this would be that any AI model, let's say a ChatGPT, Llama models, any interface that any user can can want to use. Um, they have access to a, a diverse set of graph databases. For the ones who might know, graph databases might think of Neo4j, for example. Um, so the idea is like every message or every knowledge base is connected semantically bet between them. So then it's easier to navigate between point A to B. Um, that they are constantly updated because then humans keep extending this graph database with the interactions they have with AI. So then the idea would be to create a dynamic rag. So then the knowledge base that they are using keeps growing and keeps you know evolving and uh, adapting to every user needs. Um, so the, the knowledge is retrieved with a better context and can create these knowledge paths between points. Um, so the idea would be that knowledge evolves as much as society does. Uh, and uh, we can identify what fields their opportunities for innovation. In a few words, like in the long term, um, the idea would be that uh, AI models become smaller enough so then they don't have to focus on like having a huge database and we, uh, you know, uh, get all Reddit knowledge base and then we train on that data or that we filter or some. Instead, probably it would be something like uh, making the models as model as like the models that the user interact with uh, smaller so they can crawl through uh, knowledge bases that have all these rack systems already in place that will allow them to have capabilities. So then I will be able to, I just have one one model that runs, for example, locally on my phone, and it will be able to access to a knowledge base from the government for me to be able to pay taxes. It will be uh, access to um, a knowledge base on, on, on Netflix, I don't know, that will uh, recommend me the things that I, are important for me, depending on what context I'm willing to give. So then it becomes like, you know, diverse and I can select what interface I also want to use. Um, so AI textbooks, as much as, you know, it's, a, it's, it's something we're trying to build as a company, it's also a philosophy of thinking of reinventing, not reinventing wheel, but changing the way how things work uh, to make, you know, more, more of a participatory approach, a low competition as well, because, you know, like any, any interface can be used and integrated with this. Uh, but it's uh, focusing to creating knowledge in a way that is collaboratively and then everyone gets the benefit from that. Um, so then I, can, I will just uh, pass the word to Matthias. Um, yes, so basically uh, one of the things we're trying to uh, address it with this in addition to uh, um, uh, having a shared knowledge uh, repository where you can essentially just query the different uh, sources. So instead of you trying to um, figure out which papers to analyze with your AI. You basically just construct a, um, a query for the information that you want to retrieve. Um, because as uh, John highlighted, um, uh, John, do you want me to take over the uh, share screen or uh, um, just a sec?
Um, just making sure you see my full screen now. Uh, uh, nope. Uh, there we go. While yeah, while you're working that out. Um, so will there be a demo, guys? Yeah, yeah, I can um, go to that demo right now. Um, um, okay, so I hope this works. Um, just make sure, do you see my Chrome uh, tab now? Yes, I see, I see Chrome. Uh, it says uh, AI textbooks ask a question on ah, the right. Perfect. So yeah. there. I think it's a little uh, bit cut off at the top, but yeah, it's there. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Zoom actually allows me to get the last in place. I hope. There we go. Yeah, this works. Yeah, something like this. Um, yeah, so essentially um, what we are currently uh, working with now, let me find it. So in essence, um, we have a Chrome extension that uh, allows synchronizing um, currently chat to BT chats. Um, so my chats uh, with ChatGPT are synchronized to my own database, uh, which can be um, in the future will be shareable by others. So you can connect your databases to say uh, if a researcher is uh, working on something, instead of uh, having to wait for their publication of uh, research, you can essentially interact through uh, this REC system where the interface for the system is your AI. Um, so say if I want to uh, um, include something from, uh, um, say, algorithmic fairness. Um, um, then we will, um, let's see. Uh, then it will return um, messages uh, related to that from the uh, database. Um, Currently, we have a simple approach in that you can just add this to your um, uh, prompt uh, from the database. But as we make it more advanced, it would automatically figure out what to include in this context. So say me and John are uh, working on a research project. Instead of having to sell ma send mails back and forth or communicate through Slack, we essentially communicate through our um, interactions with AI. Um, uh, so instead of me switching out of my context, I bring the context uh, or I bring the new information to my context. So instead of me um, say in, uh, there's a new development in terms of uh, how to um, uh, improve your rag system with uh, uh, for usage with AI. Um, then uh, um, instead of me having to figure out manually uh, which part of this research is relevant for me, uh, I essentially just have the AI uh, fetch the relevant information and provide it in context. Uh, but for the broader ecosystem, instead of uh, the AI just tailoring the answer to uh, my use case, um, then we can see, um, okay, in the larger ecosystem, we are lagging information up in this top right or in this um, top area. So uh, uh, yeah, just to clarify, this is my uh, a visualization of the embeddings of my conversations with um, ChatGPT, um, where we have it as uh, the embeddings in a uh, 3D vector space, um, where in this case, when we search for strategic generation of training data, we, uh, we get information uh, in this area, if I search for AI textbooks, we end up in an area up here instead. Um, so we can see do where. You, the... Do you mind if I interrupt for a moment? Sure. And I'm just going to speak as a as a list as a, a a listener. I'm having a little trouble understanding the use case here. Like, is there a like a generic use case you could walk through? Uh, yeah. From be from beginning to end, as if you were researching a certain topic, um, not related to algorithmic. Um, I forget the word that you used, uh, for, uh, uh, but but something that would be more generic that that somebody might use this for. Because I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around it, and I'm having trouble doing so. And I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm just okay. trying to, trying to figure it out. 
Sure. And thanks. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. much easier than uh, uh, having feedback on what to focus on. Sure. Um, so say uh, uh, if you have a status meeting in your company, uh, often you want to figure out what's going on in uh, um, in our company. So uh, where have the developments been lately? So instead of trying to um, describe that uh, context, uh, if you have your um, so you have your knowledge repository in a uh, database where you access it through a REC system. Okay. Uh, then um, uh, when you want to see, is there any new information I should uh, act upon, um, have our clients uh, um, idea of us uh, changed or do we have new developments for the product? Um, instead of having to manually read through these things, uh, you can see how the um, mm -hmm. uh, available information changes uh, in this area. Um, so say when you, uh, instead of open, or similar to if you open up your Slack, you have to skim through the messages um, mm -hmm. of uh, what has changed in this. In this case, you could see, okay, there's been changes in this area. Um, this is as I expected uh, to be. So I can skip this. Um, there's no reason for me to try to uh, read all of these because it's basically uh, in line with my intuition for what has been going on. Uh, but if so, we... so let me let me ask then, when you have uh, search and you have search by similarity, so this is your a three D representation of your embeddings. Uh, that uh, I mean they're multi dimensional, but you you rendered them somehow in 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 three D, and. Uh, and then at that point, you're providing some similarity. So by that, you means you're kind of selecting an area of the embedding model or of the vector database, right? Where you're saying, ah, we're going to be talking about stuff over here, right? Which is what um, what uh, like, like a rag would do anyway, right? Like you'd, you'd kind of say like, hey, I see you're talking about these topics and we're going to focus our you know, around these particular areas areas of everything that we have in the embeddings and then, or in the vector storage. And then, uh, and then you're able to ask a question at the top, if I'm reading that correctly, that is now already has that focus defined um, below, right? So you're not wanting to search the entire uh, space in your vector database, but you're trying to restrict it down um, to a, a specific area. Is that, am, am I, am I uh, understanding that correctly? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because uh, a uh, key problem often with these REC system is that you don't know what it actually consulted. Uh, you mm -hmm. might try to go through the papers, but uh, often you don't retrieve a full document. You just retrieve a paragraph. So it becomes right. very difficult to figure out that it actually search the things that it should search. Sure. Um, so you are perfect, uh, yeah, spot on in uh, what we are. Okay. Uh, so if I also... One thing, um, sorry, Matthias, one thing that I would also love to add there is that as we are using a graph database, in this case, Neo4j, yeah. then things are connected sequentially, right? So then if we get like certain uh, message retrieved from, I don't know, let's say the bottom, then we can like get to know more context from the previous yeah, yeah. conversations we had. So I'm familiar with with Neil Forge, and I get the idea of the of the the knowledge graph. But I I think what I'm so what I see here is you can you can restrict it to an area, and I know that there are you know, more like um one of the things that can address this challenge of pulling in the right context is using a like a re-ranker, right, to go and. Uh, look at what was pulled from the database and say, well, okay, yeah, th these aren't, act some of these contain the same semantic language, but it's not really relevant to the question being asked. Uh, and so it, it seems like you might be trying to address that same problem by restricting the the, the space in which you're going to to review. Is that, yeah. is that right? Yeah. Uh, and it gives us some insights to how it, um, um are basically similar to how we try to uh, visualize neural networks from time to time. In this mm -hmm. case, the idea is to try to um, visualize how the AI relates information and where it looks for that information. So uh, let's see, I uh, changed my 
similarity search here, I can actually get an intuition for uh, where it looks for that information. Um, mm -hmm. Then I can get an intuition for where specific information lies. So binding elements lens uh, over in this area instead. Um, so okay. the idea is that uh, when you have the uh, re-ranking, you can, um, one thing is how much the system can do on its own, but if you can use your intuition to guide it towards something, um, it makes it much easier, similar to how mm -hmm. when we went to Google, we need to, to get a mental model of how do you actually ask Google something. Um, okay. In this case, the idea is to basically learn to speak embeddings. Mm. Uh, I mean, have you looked at using the, in some ways, when you put in a question, use the language model to try to do the, to try to narrow down for you immediately in that, like almost provide the similarity first as an initial uh, initial question, kind of like re-rankers do. Re-rankers, you're running the language model again to try to figure out, okay, how do these are how do these articles or these these snippets, you know, um, need to be ordered in terms of importance. Have you done anything like that to try to instead of searching by similarity, having to put that in, actually use the question to try to um, first use the language model to determine if that what the right area is, and then use that as a starting point, almost like a, like a a, a, a pre a, a, a pre-assessment. Uh, yeah, so uh, we are in early development. So this is one of the uh, next steps. And uh, um, oh, okay. so currently, um, uh, for now, um, the Q&A is uh, a relative uh, recent addition. So okay. in this case, it doesn't look for uh, the proper context first. It just uh, um, looks directly uh, through uh, Langchain's uh, questions uh, mm -hmm. uh, prompt. But uh, essentially, you could uh, include the uh, uh, relevant um, context in this case um, to say, I can see, OK, I want to include um, this um, and this. Um, then uh, we added as context. Um, currently, I'm, not, I'm just showcasing yeah. what uh, it would look like um, from the um, in the backend, in this case, this is not the way the user would do. Right, right. And yeah. now we can define, okay, this is within the context that we want. I see. Um, and uh, I don't know if I have a too long answer or... Um, is that is that graph in the middle or in the left-hand side, is that navigatable? Like you can actually go through and start zooming yeah. in and see? Um, yeah, so of course, uh, the problem with the light demo, uh, yeah, I don't know what I've... Uh, messed up with the um, q and a but yeah in this sense in this uh we have full uh, navigability and we can also jump to the relevant uh, message when you click the individual node um I currently i have to switch out of that uh um uh space um so uh, there's a context switch but we can essentially also display the text uh, in this area. Also, if you select multiple different, you would be able to summarize uh, what is this area about. And so as we see in this case, we end up with the difficulties of keeping up the change, uh, which aligns well with what we're trying to do with the uh, AI textbooks. Um, so it, it sounds like you're taking at this plugin that you mentioned before. I'm sorry, I'm talking so much. I'm just, I'm trying no, to- No, it's uh, perfect. It's understand. much easier for us this way. Okay. Uh, it sounds like then that plugin you created that we were, that was shown when you were in Chat GPT is that you're taking the information that the, the the question and the the response and you're pulling that into your graph database. You're pulling that into your into your graph, right? And so every time you use it, you're establishing a graph, uh, additional nodes on the graph, and connectivity between those points, right? So that now you can go back and review. Um, your the knowledge that you pulled from all of these queries in a single place, right? Yeah. Is that is that accurate? Yeah. And then uh, and I, you also have to determine if the response was correct from, you know, Chat GPT, right? Because it may provide responses that are you know look great but are inherently wrong, and so yeah. you you obviously don't want those pulled in. Uh, somehow. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I want to show something quickly. Um, just to show that you're spot on with the uh, new uh, um So in essence, we have, 
let's see. In our case, we have our chat messages uh, as uh, individual nodes that are then connected to the chat that they belong to. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can fetch the relevant context. And then we have a, um, a collection of, um, let me just move this video so I can see something. Um, in this case, we have the relationships identified in the uh, um, uh, data. So let's see. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so in this case, um, in addition to the embeddings, we also run a, uh, we take the different um, documents available and then we create a graph from the semantics of that uh, uh, text and then we merge it into a larger graph, which basically mm -hmm. lets us traverse what is this knowledge base about when we have compressed it into a graph. Um, which means that uh, instead of having to navigate the chats individually, you can essentially mm -hmm. get a landscape of how are things connected in this information? Uh, and a benefit from this is that we can uh, uh, return the, uh, uh, just a sec. Um, yeah, sorry. sorry for the low level approach that just showcases the, uh, and, This not defined. Ah, oh, of course. I don't think you have. Um... Yeah, I forgot to move the uh, demo here. Um, so this is of course not the way that the only power users would uh, be uh, use it like this. Um, um, and yeah. Um, so in, in essence, no, I'm just taking oh, some. Interesting. Those were your edges. Those were your edges in the middle. Your graph edges in the middle. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then in basically what you can do is, um, of course, this would again be, uh, uh automated, um, but, uh, then you can take that, uh, uh, I have no idea if it can figure this out through here. Um, but then you can essentially just give the, um, uh, different aspects together from that graph and then have um, the AI uh, create a um, chat. Um, oh, I see, kind of makes sense of it. And then uh, based on what it has um, created this, then we can search for similar things in the database, which means that we get this high level overview of what information is available to you. And then we can uh, fetch relevant information uh, from the uh, system about this. So in this case, uh, it defines information from my thesis on how we can utilize um, uh, AI in a prompting loop where the AI prompts the human and the human uh, prompts the AI. Um, but where if I would uh, have to just go directly without the graph, I need to know what's in the graph or in the knowledge base. In this case, I can get a high level overview of what's available uh, and then uh, create the uh, relevant uh, introduction that uh, allows me to then find the relevant information, which in this case lives in this area, actually quite close to what we saw before, sure, but a sure. bit further down. Uh, so also with the uh, repetition, you begin getting an intuitive sense of where information ends up. Um, so uh, an idea is that uh, we were in, in terms of getting back to the uh, how to take a strategic approach to uh, uh, advan or advancing training uh, data for AI, the uh, goal is that, uh, as we might see in the top uh, over here, that this is a more empty space. So instead of uh, everyone fighting for creating research uh, in these more dense regions, uh, as soon as you uh, publish something, that might it might take a week or something like that, then someone else has developed a more advanced AI model. Instead of us all competing for glory in this case, where you basically live for one week, it might make sense for us to generate uh, or research more in this area and also generate training data in this that isn't just discarded. Um, uh, yeah, just to try to look back to how does all of this actually fit into the um, generation of high quality training data. Sure, sure. One thing that also like uh, I think is important to 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 mention is that 
Uh, one of the things that we're also working on now, uh, because we also believe in open open data, open science, everything, <laughs> open source, um, even though we're using ChatGPT. Um, we are developing a, a, a custom GPT that actually uses the endpoints that we provide from this collaborative knowledge base. So and two people can contribute to the same knowledge base and then get the context of the other person. Um, the idea would be, of course, like if the if the interface was a bit different, a bit more, you know, advanced, then the person can decide what context to actually provide to the to the collaborative database. Um, so then, yeah, it would be the same idea because I mean it helps, for example, in, in asynchronous communication, because then if Matthias was working in a different time zone, doing mm -hmm. something about a specific topic. Then I can like instead of like waiting for him to reply, then I can just get the context. And this actually gets much easier when there's like a group, a big group of people, uh, because then there is always something happening. Um, it can work, for example, in in um, forums, because then I mean I, I think it happened to me many times that I see a forum and there are so many channels and it's impossible to actually follow everything. Yeah. But then yeah. if I can get the the right context of the things that matter to me, then you know everyone is contributing, but I just get what is is beneficial to me. Mm -hmm. yeah by the way um at the beginning of the presentation you mentioned that um like the whole idea is to collect valuable data uh what are the sources for that data actually so like i do understand that you're basing the context on the like on the chat that uh people are having with the lms but eventually will you be able to as you mentioned uh combine different data sources and rank them by how useful they are uh, for some specific tasks uh, in terms of uh, this specific software that you build. Uh, yeah, so uh, some of this, uh, we switched uh, to research uh, or we consider switching, switching to research instead of focusing too much on specific uh, products. So the idea is to connect these different um, uh, platforms so you can have your own rack system uh, for your existing database. Um, and all kinds of other uh, it's basically this is agnostic to if you're using it for chat so if you're using it for pdfs or even excel spreadsheets or whatever it is as long as you have a way of indexing that data uh, our system essentially doesn't care um, or the under fundamentals of it doesn't care about it so uh, the demo that you see here is uh, with chat GPT is one way of implementing it but we're trying to focus on how do we advance the field in, uh, and help other companies uh, implement these things. So uh, in this, we currently don't uh, have a product that we are selling as such, um, because then we quickly limit ourselves to a very limited scope. The idea is more to figure out how do we create an ecosystem where everyone can um, have a way of interconnecting things. For example, also that for this specific case, uh, uh, or for this specific model on hogging phase, what's relevant training data for that. Um, what we'd like to figure out is, um, to, currently we have our training data systems like o, or data sets like OMORGA. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, it's basically just trying to provide a textbook quality data set, but mm. uh, even though it's high quality, it's highly dependent on what you need it for. Uh, maybe it's good for general purpose, but if you're a um, legal company, uh, it might not really be optimal for what you need it for. So for the legal company, they uh, want another data set, but instead of them trying to figure out uh, how to get that, we're trying to figure out how can we combine both the, uh, yeah, the specific training data, match it to the individuals that need it and the models that they're using. Uh, but of course, that's quite an undertaking. So we're trying to look at it more from a research perspective rather than uh, providing this solution up front. I like this idea that you can find gaps in it, right? So, for example, one of the areas I'm interested in I, I um, is uh, uh, chip design, right? And, and so the language that you use for doing that is Verilog oftentimes, right, uh, for creating the Verilog uh, the HDL. And so I was thinking there are there's at least one model on Hugging Face that has used um, uh, their own model to to train it using some open data that I think is on uh, GitHub for Verilog, right? They try to train it to do a good job at writing Verilog. OpenAI can write Verilog too, 
but I think this model is trying to do better and obviously on a smaller footprint. So if you look at what the training data is and you pull all that in, it's interesting then to see, I think, where the gaps are in the training data, if that's possible, and almost mapping that, if there was a way to map that to what your target is, like what you're trying to accomplish and what the training data provides and seeing where there are gaps where you may have to provide uh, information to supplement in the training to give it the abilities that you want, right? Or at least try to steer it in that direction. Uh, so if I'm if I'm reading you correctly, that's that's one of the areas you're trying to to address. Now, where you get that additional training data, maybe you use uh, uh, Chat GPT or you know GPT four other models to provide examples, uh, so that that training data now gets filled in. Now your the areas that are that are a bit more sparse, you know, can be now filled in. You can go back and look and say, oh, okay, I've got a more full featured model based on what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, if I'm hearing you correctly, that's that's an area that you're trying to address. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, exactly what uh, set us uh, on this question that uh, basically figuring out how to be identified by, by the most uh, crucial uh, uh, resource or uh, basically optimizing resource allocation to say uh, instead of you trying to continue creating training data and that basically has diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. uh, where every new data point you add basically only increases it by a millionth percent or something like that. Mm. Whereas in this past area, you might actually get half a percentage improvement sure. for a uh, smaller data sets increase. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, the, the interesting thing is that uh, there are like different uh, papers on how different AI models are degrading if they are using um, the data set that was generated from some other AI model as their training data. So I guess one of the biggest challenges in this case, like as you mentioned, um, the data will uh, be um, like limited until 2027. I don't think it's uh, it would disappear entirely because this problem is uh, being um, like a lot of different companies are working to figure it out, but uh, like what I want to say is that um, you will have one of the biggest problems around the correct data set. And since a lot of um, basically social media posts, articles, like a lot of stuff on the internet is being generated by LLMs right now, you need to be cautious about what you're using. You can't just scrap the internet and assume that all of that has been generated by human hand as a chat GPT did, for example, you need to be cautious that like half of that content is basically LLM generated. And probably uh, if you will train your uh, models on that content, uh, the quality of the output will degrade compared to some other LLM. So yeah, that's, um, um, uh, that's one, one of the challenges, I guess. Yeah, yeah, we basically already polluted the uh, information space because we don't know exactly what's AI generated anymore. Uh, but of course, also depending on the source, uh, this AI generated data might be better than other trainings. That's so it's more about figuring out which of this has a positive and which has a uh, negative impact on the um, uh, training of it. Uh, I'll just read the message uh, from Bill. Oh, uh, yeah, so if I read this correct, uh, um, so uh, in this case, where's the incentive for companies to provide uh, knowledge to this in, uh, so others don't just uh, steal it for their benefit, uh, if I'm correct? Yeah. Well, wh where do you plan to, to, to go with this? Uh, what, are your, what are your next steps or... Uh... Uh, when do you when do you become a unicorn? <laughs> uh, yeah, so we uh, in essence uh, uh, we are in a um, spot of figuring out uh, is it a uh, startup or, or is it research that makes sense or potentially a consultancy? Uh, because for many of the things that we're working on here is uh, the focus is on collaboration, and you can quickly end up in competition if you're trying to build a startup because if you just give your solutions away for free to others um 
you uh, it becomes difficult for you to uh, uh, compete with them if they're not playing the same game uh, like Amazon does with uh, open source projects, basically just taking the code, uh, hiding their own code, and then delivering a solution that basically just utilizes your product uh, uh, without giving back. Um, so uh, the uh, goal is to figure out um, which areas we can uh, perform research in where we get to focus on some of the bigger um, aspects of this to help um, chart out where it might be uh, interesting for companies to begin looking into and then consult companies on uh, how they can implement some of these strategies either uh, as companies that focus on this or companies that just want to have a more strategic approach to how they generate and utilize data. I you think know, one thing, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say that that you have uh, people, you're talking about businesses, but you also have in, uh, individuals, too, who uh, track their information. I mean, look, back when, when Evernote came out, that was a big deal, right? Because like, oh, I got suddenly I have this note taking tool. And by the way, it can read text, you know, from images, and that was useful. So it was like, oh, I got this one place to store all the stuff that I need to eventually deal with at some point, or I'd like to remember, right? So we could all become information hoarders. But now you have tools like Obsidian, right, which are naturally graph oriented to some degree and for capturing, you know, knowledge. And I know there's a number of other applications out there. And and yet now we're on, what are we on? We're on chat GPT and we're asking all kinds of questions. And all we have is this linear reverse chronological list of all the chats we've ever had, right? And there's no way to really organize them uh, in a way that makes sense to us. So it, it seems to me you have a natural path towards a, um, an application, a research application, just for the day-to-day -day person that is trying to, you know, let's think of a student, right? And I, I'm going to harken back to the name that you have, textbooks, right? Where they're just trying to figure out how to how to uh, better understand, comprehend their the material that are in their class and be able to organize it in such a way where they can go back to any of the conversations they've had with ChatGPT in a, a more graph oriented fashion, right? Where I can see, oh, this knowledge, all these things, doesn't matter the day I asked it, doesn't doesn't matter, right? No. Uh, just tell me, like, I'm trying to find this information, a way of organizing your uh, your thoughts or your your, your investigations, uh, I think is, is interesting in a very automated, you know, methodical way that you can go back and continue to use that context for future conversations that add more, um, you know, that I think on a, on a personal level, I think is very interesting. Uh, you know, my, and then of course you go to businesses and you have you know projects and things like that. But I, I'm just thinking of it from even from the individual level. That's a it's a useful uh, way of of uh, kind of putting a layer on top of ChatGPT. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's also uh, uh, I before the uh, Chrome extension, uh, we actually built the here. Uh, VS Code extension. So uh, similar to with Obsidian, you can use uh, VS Code for node management with uh, wiki links and such. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, it also um, uh, it basically organizes your conversations into um, uh, folders. So if you have the um, uh, files in the same folders, um, it automatically includes them in the context. So for example, when you develop something and you put a documentation file or a markdown file, with the code, then it automatically has access to the code um, as a way of uh, making uh, all of the uh, retrieval of context relevant or mm -hmm. retrieving the relevant context based on your current uh, situation. Uh, but uh, yeah, a key um, a, um, aspect of this is basically to try to have self-organizing information. Uh, as you said, when we're all information holders, um, if we can just focus on holding the information uh, and the uh, relationships are to a large degree automatic, basically with embeddings, we have uh, implicit relationships and regress, we have explicit relationships. But if you manually have to create all of the explicit relationships, um, then uh, um, you lose out on a lot of the um, potential relationships available in the and hopefully with a system like this, as you begin to, uh, because this is compressed into a 3D space from a high dimensional space. Yeah. When we see uh, things light up, it's not in a tight cluster because they are connected in the high dimensional space. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but an idea here is that uh, if 
you begin understanding how things are connected in these higher dimensional spaces, similar to how you might identify a shadow, which is, uh, or you can recognize what object is uh, projecting this shadow, even though it's a 2D representation of a 3D uh, representation, uh, we might be able to begin to think in these higher dimensional connections uh, and beginning mm -hmm. to see, okay, this area often lights up uh, together with uh, this area, which, uh, or in these cases, we might, sometimes we end up with something that uh, looks like mountain ranges uh, mm -hmm. in these. So you can begin getting an intuition for how is your information related semantically or in the way that, that the embeddings uh, organizes it. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's not just the relationships we can uh, make ourselves between specific nodes. It also helps us to begin to see the, in essence, the embeddings is a collection of, uh, our, of different perspectives on what things are connected. So it's been, it's basically yeah. like having a thousand people looking at something and all trying to see, oh, this might be connected to this thing over here. And if we can tap into that shared intuition for what's connected, um, mm -hmm. we can go much further than what Wikilinks allows us. It seems to me you would need to uh, consider, I mean, you're, you're obviously, as you said, you're, you're reducing down from an n-dimensional space to a three-dimensional space. And so you could lay this out any number of ways. You know, depending on what dimension, how however you're doing the, the compression of dimensions, but you could um, look at it, especially in in terms of what your cluster is that you're interested in, and then relay this out according to that cluster. And so, you know, where there may be items that are related, and in this particular view, they look far away. You relay this out according to how they actually are clustered, and then expand out from there in a different way, where then it might be easier to see where there are true gaps. Um, and if like, I can yeah. quickly uh, show something highly related yeah. to this, uh, because, uh, or maybe you can shift, uh, John. Uh, yeah, no, I know, I think it's, we can see. That it, is uh, mine, perfect. Yeah. Uh, yes, so uh, uh, I don't have uh, full time to showcase um, uh, this, but uh, in essence, uh, some of the other things we're looking into, instead of just this 3D projection of the information, uh, we can also look to other mathematical ways of uh, uh, indexing information. So in a case like this, um, I hope you see the colored uh, map, uh, um, which uh, in this case, it uh, highlights when you have a uh, uh, any point within any of the colored zones, um, uh, then they will convert to the uh, this root of the same color. And in some cases we have these uh, that initially seems quite weird, but they actually end up in a different space based mm. on how they're mapped. So we can essentially see, okay, these things are actually connected. Uh, so we can get a better intuitive sense of how things are connected. And as we add more points, we of course get more complexity, but it also allows us to um, understand more complex relationships. Um, and over time with exposure to these things, you might just plot your data into this and then you see uh, what does uh, the structure end up looking like and then you get a sense for how are things connected in this. Uh, so there are plenty of opportunities just beyond uh, embeddings. And that's also why we want to focus on research because uh, in addition to just uh, knowledge as a moving target, our approach also becomes a moving target in how do we uh, actually deliver this um, or better experiences to people. Um, Matthias, I also wanted to share like uh, two things. Um, I think like, for example, one application for that would be to create um, knowledge paths or learning paths, right? Like when you identify a, a gap in your knowledge, then you can go from uh, A to B. And then if you have access to someone else's knowledge path, then, you know, you can make that path smaller because you get the context of someone else who didn't actually interact with you. Um, I think that's, that's the collaborative part of it. Um, but yeah, I can, I, I just like also uh, leading the questions of Bill. I think like the system for, of patenting, for example, are something, the structures that exist already. And then they, of course, they, they motivate people to, uh, you know, have certain protection about their creations. But I think there's a lot of discussion about uh, academia and then open science about the idea of like reducing the idea of copyright or like uh, 
uh, intellectual property to actually being able to instead give knowledge away for free and focusing on uh, attribution systems where basically we know who did it and then there is like a you know scheme of retributing to those people um, to actually foster innovation because then if there is like a someone who has made a really good improvement in something but then that's never shared then you know we we like we if instead we collaborate to actually make that better of course it would require the companies to be faster but then it would benefit but it's it's definitely a complex problem and uh, <laughs> the idea of co knowledge collaboration uh it's it's something also requires time and uh a lot of discussion to actually understand what is the right way to do it because even Matthias now discussed like the way of you know connecting this knowledge and with Matt of uh, you know constructing and uh, showing the, the the information and knowledge in different ways uh, but then what would be those ways and how we do we define that in a way that respects everyone's culture and you know it, it becomes <laughs> highly yeah. complex but yeah those are really really nice questions you had guys. Yeah, folks, I've um, made a screenshot of those. So if you'd like to reply to them, like in a bit more complex way, uh, I guess we can share them on Slack so that the people who are watching the recording would understand what the context is and would be able to see the actual questions uh, in inside of our community. Uh, so yeah, uh, guys, thank you very much for joining the call. Uh, Tyler, if you'd like to ask any questions, uh, I guess we we are able to ping John and Matthias uh, inside of our community. Bill, thank you for, for the questions. Uh, Matt, uh, thanks for uh, chatting and uh, thanks for all, all the efforts uh, to uh, help uh, every, like to, to figure everything out. So yeah, guys, thank you for the call. I uh, hope mm -hmm. to see you in the community and uh, in a couple months. Can't wait to see the message in our Slack community that uh, from both of you, John and Matthias, like, hey guys, we've got our first VC funding. We've got like 20 million US dollars and we are taking it from here. So there yeah, yeah, I, I <laughs> hope you so. Yeah, so thank you very much everyone have a great rest of your day and uh, yeah, yep. see ya. take care everybody thank you max thank you everybody it was really nice talking to you it was a pleasure take care bye bye, take care. bye, -bye.